We are told Keir Starmer has completed unconscious bias training, but does he need lessons in identifying racism which is a little bit more explicit? That's the question I asked myself after watching him respond to a caller on LBC this morning. So the lady had phoned in to ask Keir Starmer what he thought about her husband, who she said had been one of the fans booing at Millwall's match when the players took a knee. Starmer said he disagreed with the booing, but then failed to challenge her on something she said which was far more worrying. Let's take a look. Taking the knee and the players and the referees um, very often take the knee. And I think um, that's why it's symbolic. I mean, even Les Ferdinand, who you'll probably know, just to remind my listeners, was a very successful football player, happens to be a black fellow himself. He's now the first black man to be a director of football. He's with the championship Queen's Park Rangers, and he says it is hollow. It's like a fancy hashtag or a lapel. It's his achieving nothing. Well, I don't secure. think that's right. What? Well, what? I think he, the counter... He's a black man who played football for England. I mean, he, he's in a position of knowledge, isn't he? So he is, of course, and I respect his view, of course. So it doesn't mean I agree with it. Um, I think that what's happened over the many years, this is the counter argument, it's quite a powerful one, is that there is um, racial inequality, there is injustice, and from time to time, it you know, becomes an issue, it's looked at for a few weeks, and then it goes away, and this is an attempt to keep the focus on it until things really change. Hasn't the round now focused just on taking the knee? And the important issue of getting black managers, black directors of football, black chairmen or chairwomen of clubs, I mean, that's been lost because we just take the knee. So no, I don't, I don't think it's one or the other. I think you can do both, and it's right. a way of drawing attention um, to it. But, I, you know, in the end, it's for each individual to decide how but they want to tackle injustice. Why did you, uh, Gemma, why did your husband... Sorry, you didn't quite explain, if I may go there again. Why did he choose not... To, uh, cho choose to boo, sorry. Because if anything, the racial inequality is now against the indigenous people of Britain because we are set to become a minority by 2066. And taking the knee, bringing that into, bringing the political sphere into the football arena, um, and we just have to look across to the Middle East. You know, Israel has a state law that they are the only people in that country to have self-determination. Well, why can't I, as a, as a white British female, have that same right? Final point to you on this, Sakir. But Gemma, we, we all have those rights. This is about recognising some injustice has gone on for a very, very long time. And I think people were genuinely moved this year um, and want to make sure that that injustice is, is dealt with. And, you know, people will look at it different ways, but I think the vast majority of people do want um, a more equal society. Gemma, thank you. Now, I mean, I, I think actually Keir Starmer's answer in the first half of that clip was quite good. I think his, his defense of people taking a knee was, was very thoughtful um, and very persuasive. The second half, though, I mean, let's go over what that caller said. So the caller said that actually it's, it's white people who are oppressed in this country because they're about to become a minority by 2066. Projections from um, some demographer, now that's sort of become core to the, the great replacement theory. I'm sure Ash will talk about that in, in more detail in a moment. What I want to focus on now, that the caller suggested we learn from the nation state law in Israel and pass a law, which is basically saying, let's pass a law guaranteeing self-determination for white Brits. Um, so she's saying, why, why don't white Brits have the same right to self-determine um, that Jews in Israel do? And in response, Keir Starmer says, we all have those rights. No, we, we don't all have those rights. We don't all have the right to live in an ethno state where our ethnicity is, is treated um, with, 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 you know, as privileged over others. I mean, it's essentially apartheid, right? Now, I, obviously, I'm not saying that, that that clip shows you that Keir Starmer supports apartheid. But I do think it is quite troubling that that is essentially, I mean, that's how you can interpret his words. He didn't challenge um, that woman who said, let's have self-determination for white people in Britain like they have um, self-determination for Jews only in Israel. Um, he, he, he sort of just brushed it off. Ash, I want to bring you in on this. Um, Keir Starmer, he has done unconscious bias training, but he, I mean, either he didn't recognize what I thought was quite blatant white supremacy there, or he felt that it wasn't appropriate to challenge it. Well, he should really be getting a refund on that unconscious bias training, shouldn't he? If you can't pick up on really obvious white nationalist conspiracism when it's right in front of you. And look, me and you have both done radio phone and shows and sometimes you don't get to say all the things that you want to say and you kick yourself a while after. But I don't think that's quite what happened here. I think what has happened here is that Keir Starmer was listening for what he knew to prepare for, which was the question on Millwall and booing and BLM and taking the knee. And it meant that he had just tuned out these i mean it's not even a racist dog whistle right it's an absolute honking white nationalist vuvuzela and what that indicates to me is a certain lack of racial literacy 
is what I would call it, a lack of racial literacy from Keir Starman. We've seen this, you know, a couple of times before when he, you know, called Black Lives Matter a moment and not a movement. Um, when he, you know, dismissed defunding the police out of hand, which is fine if that's a policy decision that you you disagree with and want to distance yourself from. But with this kind of degree of, of disrespect for the activists uh, who had generated it, he doesn't have that kind of discerning ear and ability to uh, react and to respond from a place of, I think, very deep confidence and knowledge. And that's going to be a problem. And it's not going to be a problem because the left who are phenomenally disempowered within Labour are going to kick off. That's not going to be a thing that troubles him. What is going to trouble him is that this phenomenon of great replacement conspiracism and this kind of, you know, subterranean media infrastructure, ecology, which is sort of being generated and nurtured by the alt-right, this kind of phoning into radio shows in order to wedge in your white nationalist talking points, that is only going to grow. And unless you have a Labour leader who's able to identify when this is going on and have some kind of prepared response to it, which is making, you know, a real impassioned defense of the kind of society that he wants to see, a multiracial, multiethnic, and multicultural democracy, then a, a Labour leader is not going to get anywhere nearer Downing Street than his predecessors, I think. And there's also one more thing that I briefly want to touch on, if that's okay, and it's about the matter of the Great Replacement itself. Because whenever I call the Great Replacement a conspiracy theory, I have a million and one far-right thunderheads in my mentions, sharing this one clip from a video that I did a few years ago called uh, Against Integration. And it's a nine-second clip in which I highlight some statistics which had been reported, I think, in the Daily Mail, uh, indicating demographic change in London. And I go, all right, lads, we're winning. And the reason why they clip this and they distribute it is they think that it represents not only me saying, oh, the great replacement is real, but saying, and I'm a part of it. I endorse it and I think it's really good. The actual much longer video uh, is about the research produced by a sociologist called Ted Cantle. And I cite those statistics because I think that what it shows is that he handled this data in a very biased way. He looks at rising diversity and because he judges it by the fact that you have a smaller proportion of white Brits in diverse areas, he goes, oh, that's a segregated neighborhood. I disagree with that fundamentally. The Great Replacement is a conspiracy theory which essentially says that there is a kind of shadowy, you know, cabal of elites, often coded as Jewish. It's, you know, very, very close to, uh, you know, lots of other anti-Semitic myths, this great, great replacement, that's pulling the strings to try and, you know, eradicate, uh, you know, the indigenous white race from Europe and America and sometimes Australia. This is, of course, complete hokum. What they do is they take these statistics which show demographic change, and there's all kinds of demographic change, right? There's religious demographic change, there's racial demographic change, obviously. There's also age demographic change, which no one seems to have that big of a problem with. And they go, see, your, your race is under attack. No, what's going on and what, what drives these numbers is that, you know, those waves of, of immigration, which were once kind of temporary, people would come over, they'd make some money, they'd move back. That's changed. People have settled down, they put down roots, they have children, they fall in love, you know, they make lives with one another. They actually perform the kind of integration which everyone's telling me is the right thing to do. Um, and that's what, what drives this, this great replacement conspiracy theory. It says that essentially demographic change is the result of these nefarious forces which are, which are trying to rob white people of what's rightfully theirs. And it's very closely linked to anti-Semitism, also very, very closely linked with lots of really horrible stuff to do with, you know, anti-abortion, you know, very, very conservative on reproductive rights. And I think it's important that when this is going to be, I think, such a core part of, of you know, the far right story going forward, and you can see that there is this porousness between the barrier between mainstream opinion and alt-right opinion because of the kind of like, you know, huge electoral upsets of, you know, Donald Trump having won in the 2016 uh, American election. You know, you've also got hard right Brexit, you've got this current composition of Boris Johnson's cabinet, and then you've also got 
a media ecology which is constantly drawing on these figures and elevating them to pundit status, this is going to be something which is going to, I think, you'll hear about it more and more in our politics. And Keir Starmer, if he wants to, actually be a trusted figure on anti-racism. And I've got no doubt that that is something that he wants to do, um, if not always has the tools to be able to do. It's going to have to work out a strategy for it because tuning it out, responding to the question that you wanted to hear rather than the comments that you did actually hear simply isn't good enough. Say he wasn't listening actually gives him more credit than he deserves. I mean, he's an intelligent man. He was clearly listening to what was said. And he didn't, he either didn't recognize that something very, <laughs> something drawn from white supremacy was said, or explicitly white supremacist was said, or he didn't feel comfortable challenging it. And, and, and one thing that I think actually stood out for me is that he clearly wasn't paying attention in the whole summer long debate that we had about the IHRA definition of, of anti Semitism. Because if he had, he would know that one of the big problems with that, one of the big complaints people had was that by saying that um, Israel has a right to self-determine, essentially, that that can be used to justify the nation state law, which is to say that if a people have a right to self-determination, then they have a right to be an ethnic majority in a nation, which is precisely what's what's um, motivating the nation state law, which is to say that, yes, look, there's concerns in Israel um, that Arabs are you know, reproduce it, I'm using their horrible language, that the Arab population is growing faster than the Jewish population. So to secure the rights of, of the Jewish population, you have to put um, basically a bit of an apartheid clause in the constitution to say, even if Jews no longer are the majority, they still are the only people with rights to to have ownership of, of, of that nation, essentially. And this is being taken up by white supremacists in this country who are saying, ah, look, there is a danger that whites will no longer be, or white people, sorry, I, I don't <laughs> want to use that language. White people will no longer be whites, the majority. You sound, you sound like, you know, de Klerk or something. The, the whites. The whites. Um, I mean, that, that, that's, <laughs> that's what the caller was suggesting. Um, because Keir Starmer wasn't paying attention to IRA, he wasn't paying attention to the nation state law. He didn't notice that. I noticed that in like half a second, right? And, and that completely went over his head because he's, he's not paying Paying attention to liberation struggles around the world and the nature of ethno-nationalism is, is something that he, he he's he's not alive to and that means he completely missed a point there um, i want to talk uh, a bit more context for you which is that thanks to researchers on on twitter we know that the caller was was not actually Gemma from cambridge as she claimed but someone who goes by the name of jody k um, so she has a youtube channel promoting far-right conspiracy theories and is a supporter of the far-right patriotic alternative group apparently she was she is actually in, she was introduced to Gemma from Cambridge, as I said, but she is in fact a yoga teacher in Ibiza. Um, the far right were also pleased with how it went. So this is a screenshot from a far right Telegram broadcast. It was found by the crowdsourcing collective Red Flare on Twitter. Definitely worth a, a follow. And you can see there, this is a far right account, Charlie Big Potatoes official. I don't know where the, the name comes from. They say an absolute masterclass of griping, which is to say you go on sort of mainstream platforms and put in conspiracy theories unbeknownst to the to the to the host from Jody Kay here as all Keir Starmer can do is try and worm his way out of answering any of her points well done Jody now obviously they're, they're being completely opportunistic they're claiming this is a victory because it makes them look good but it, it's, it's undeniable that Keir Starmer didn't successfully challenge and in fact by saying we all have those rights in a way by accident I, I'm, I'm sure by accident reinforced and legitimized the quite horrific views which were being put to him